Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends and the dark side of the Sunshine State. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra content, please sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. And be sure to visit our website where you can pick up some Paradise After Dark gear. On our website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, our mailing list, our social medias, and our Patreon. So we also have a virtual tip jar there at ParadiseAfterDark.com where you can uh, give us a little tip and we'll give you a shout out on the show. Speaking of which... Yes, we have a shout out to Amy from Miami. My Thank Amy. You. From my Amy. And a special shout out, a generous, generous tip from Brutus the Barber Beefcake. <laughs> Actually, he wanted to remain anonymous, but we're just going to call him Brutus, Brutus the Barber the Beefcake. Barber beefcake. <laughs> beefcake! He knows who he is. Beefcake! <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I also want to give a big shout out to our new friends that we met last week at Pelican Larry's, Sam and Mindy. They bought us a beer. That's awesome. That What a great story. What nice people. Yeah, they were they were so sweet. And... Um, it, it was just really nice to meet. I love to meet people that actually listen to us. Exactly. And a little <laughs> tip. If you ever see us anywhere, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on up. Say come hi. Come on over. We especially like it if you buy us beer. But you I don't mean, even have you to don't do that. have to. Just come but... say hi. Say, what's up? And I'm going to say, what's up? And they're going to say, what's up? And say, what's up? Anyway. So, well, thank you, guys. We really appreciate the... Uh, appreciate the generous donations to help out the show. It Thanks. really does go to... Uh, Good cause. Yeah. It's a really good it, cause It here. goes to Paradise After Dark. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a big help. But anyway, and uh, again, don't be shy. Come see us. So, Lauren, tonight we're talking about um, one of Florida's – I don't want to say – I guess it is kind of a lesser-known case. It's not. It's lesser, like, publicized, if you will. Maybe, yeah. Maybe you could that, – maybe that's a good way to describe it. But it's a definitely a weird – case could we say mysterious mysterious i like the word totally mysterious mysterious. very mysterious so we are going to be talking about the disappearance of ben mcdaniel so on august 18th of 2010 30 year old scuba diver ben mcdaniel was last seen diving in the underwater cave at vortex springs in ponce de leon florida can i give you just a little fun fact about vortex spring Sure. Now, Vortex Springs in, is kind of in the Panhandle area of of uh, Florida, but it was actually purchased by the Dockery family, who's from Michigan. Now, the Dockery family, um, he was actually designer and inventor, and he's the one that sort of institutionalized the diver down flag. So this is like a premier spot in Florida. So the Vortex Spring that we're going to talk about tonight is a is a pretty well known. It's a widely spot. popular place for scuba divers. Exactly to, to the point where this guy that designed the actual diving flag bought this spring, and that's the original owners of the spring. Oh, pretty I neat. didn't know that. The little red, the little red flag, yeah. with the angled white. Yeah, he was in the navy. That little red flag was kind of the navy flag that he sort of re revitalized and changed a little of this and that. And then, like the fifties, I think it was he. Bam. It got institutionalized to where now that's an official recognized diver down flag. Huh. Dockery I, family out of Michigan. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that I'm little I'm full tidbit. of all kinds of nothing. So first let's talk about Ben McDaniel. So Ben was born April 15th, 1980 in Memphis, Tennessee to Shelby and Patty McDaniel. He was the oldest of three sons. His younger brother, Paul, died in 2008 at the age of 22 from what the family claimed was a stroke. But later an autopsy would reveal that it was actually a drug overdose. Before disappearing, Ben was going through a rough patch in his life. He had just gone through a messy divorce and his construction company had gone under. He owed the state of Tennessee and the IRS about $50,000 in back taxes. Whoa. He also had a little bit of a criminal history, including drug charges. He moved back in with his parents in Collierville, Tennessee, just outside of Memphis. At this point, his parents, who by all accounts were very wealthy, suggested that Ben take a sabbatical, offering to support him financially while he and his dog, a chocolate lab he had rescued, 
lived in the family's beach home at Santa Rosa Beach on the Emerald Coast of the Florida Panhandle. He moved there in April of 2010. It's such a beautiful area there, too. It is. Can you send me on a sabbatical there? Do you have any beach homes there? No. May We need a couple more patrons before we can okay. get a beach home up there. It's such a beautiful area up there. Well, Ben McDaniel had taken up scuba diving when he was 15 years old. Now, he would often practice in the family swimming pool, and he would dive every chance that he got when they stayed at their beach house in Florida. Now, although he was currently living on the beach, Ben preferred to dive in fresh water. Can't say I blame him. I mean, there's a lot of critters in salt water. There's critters in fresh water, too. You know, not like there is salt there's water. There's alligators not, in well, fresh water. Those usually don't go deep like diving. But anyway, he frequently visited the Vortex Spring that Lauren spoke about earlier. And this is about an hour's drive inland from his home. Now, Vortex Spring is a commercially operated recreation, camping, and dive park. And to understand this case, I think it's important that our listeners understand Vortex Spring and the cave below the surface. Now, it is a cold, freshwater spring. Now, this cave is, always stays at the temperature of, what, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, they said? Yeah, 20 you know, degrees Celsius. Caves do are cold. Have you ever been to caves? Like, no. Like just, well, you don't. I don't like caves. They freak me out. I'm not talking about an underwater cave, but if you go into any cave, like if you go to Sea Rock City, they take you down in the cave, and it's always cool. Of course, that's a, that one, there's always water running through it. You hear water running, but you don't know where. But it's a very cool area. So this cave is no different, even though it's underwater. It stays at 68 degrees, regardless of the surface temperature, which is pretty interesting. Now, it's the largest diving facility in the state of Florida, and they do offer diving instruction for all levels. Now, all the divers there are required to present a proof of open water certification and sign a release of liability. And for the most experienced divers, some of whom come from around the world, the main attraction of the Vortex Spring is this cave. This cave starts at 300 feet, which is 91 meters, from the cavern at a depth of 115 feet, 35 meters for our non-U.S. listeners. You mean the rest of the world? Pretty much. (laughs) Now, the entrance is a sign depicting the Grim Reaper warning divers that the consequences of continuing past that point could be fatal. The cave has been a controversial aspect of the spring. Here's a tip. If you're diving and you see the Grim Reaper, just stop, maybe, turn around. Maybe turn around. I don't know. Yeah. And during the early 1990s, 13 divers died while exploring this cave. And the state of Florida threatened to ban diving near cave entrances as a result of frequent cave diving accidents. But local divers responded by developing a special cave diving certification that became the standard requirement for sections of the underwater caves known to be particularly hazardous. Now, the certification requires two months training, including 125 dives with an instructor or certified diving partner. Vortex Spring complied with this by erecting a locked underwater gate at the entrance to the dangerous section of the cave. With the Grim Reaper. With the Grim Reaper. Starting from the gate, over 1,600 feet, or 490 meters, through the area's limestone bedrock have been mapped to the depth of 310 feet, or 94 meters. The cave's full extent is not known. At some points, the passage narrows to 10 inches wide, requiring divers who would pass through to take off their tanks and hold them at their sides or in front, and twist their bodies. That's a sign right there. You don't need a Grim Reaper sign to stop there. Only those who have valid cave diving certificates are permitted to pass the gate, requiring a staff member to unlock the gate and typically accompany them during the dive. Ben was not certified to dive in the cave beyond the gate. But Ben was a regular at Vortex Spring, and the staff there had gotten to know him pretty well. At six foot two inches and two hundred and twenty pounds, he was hard to miss. One of the employees, Chuck Cronin, told the Tampa Bay Times in 2011 that he believed that while Ben had the proper equipment and considerable diving knowledge, he was often overly confident in his abilities and not shy about saying so. In 2014, Ben's father Shelby commented on a blog post about Ben's case on a website called Leisure Pro. He stated that Ben could not find anyone at Vortex Spring willing to be his diving partner, so he did his dives alone. He preferred to dive alone anyway. Ben was brave, his father later said. Ben was fearless. He followed his passions. 
So I kind of take away from the, the two conflicting – not too conflicting, but I guess the two coincide because Cronin is saying that Ben was – Confident in his abilities and not shy to say so, which a sounds to overly me overly confident is what I kind of get over that. I get a sense of arrogance. You know, I, I kind of sense like some arrogance, and this is going to play later in when we kind of discuss some of the theories here. But then his father's saying that he liked to dive alone, so it's it's kind of a, I don't know. I'll explain later. Remind me to explain to okay. you later what I'm getting at. Now, on the day that Ben disappeared, he was at Vortex Spring. Now, witnesses saw him do one dive midday. He was seen by other divers studying the entrance to the cave. So, obviously, he stopped. People saw him kind of focused on this cave and this at the entrance. Now, after resurfacing, he filled his tanks at the dive shop, and there's a transaction that was recorded on security cameras. So, we know that he was there. We know that he refilled his tanks. And now, for the most of the rest of the day, he was seen by himself alongside the spring, Witnesses said he was testing equipment and making notes in his dive log. Now, he called his mother on a cell phone, and this this being the last contact he had with any of his family around 7.30 p.m. Now, as the sun was setting that night, he switched on his lights, and he began his descent into the Vortex Springs again. Now, Cronin and fellow employee Eduardo Toran, on their way back from a dive themselves, something they did often on Wednesdays after the shop closed, saw Ben as he began descending with his lights on and wearing a helmet surging toward the mouth of the cave. He was diving toward a sign that said stop, toward another bearing a picture of the Grim Reaper that we spoke about earlier and the words that read, go no farther, there's nothing in the cave worth dying for. Tehran, who had suspected for some reason that Ben was forcing the gate open, went down to him and just unlocked it, watching Ben go in and then he returned to Cronin. This particular so, Tehran believed for some time that Ben had been forcing the gate open. Yes. And going into the cave, even though he wasn't supposed to. So, he just went down there and unlocked it? Yeah, he just goes down and opens the gate up and lets him go in. Again, remember, he's been but coming... But he's not certified. But he, he kind of... They know that his skill level is probably enough to get certification, but he wasn't theoretically cer- certified. And plus, remember, they knew him. I mean, you get to know people when you go to places. You become a regular, so they kind of look at you differently. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, Yeah, I guess as we move on here, it uh, starts to come together. On some nights when they had seen Ben dive late, the two had stayed at the spring after resurfacing until they saw bubbles on the surface, indicating that Ben was beginning to decompress in order to safely resurface. But on the night of the 18th, they instead went back to Turan's house for coffee. So these two employees at Vortex Springs, Eduardo Turan and Chuck Cronin, knew he wasn't certified to go beyond the gate, but unlocked it for him anyway and then surfaced and left him down there. Ben's truck was still in the parking lot the next morning, But with many summer visitors coming to enjoy the site's many water-based recreational opportunities and picnic grounds, in addition to diving, the employees were, or later claimed to have been, too busy to note it. Yeah, this place is not just this little diving spring. This place is a water park. I mean, there's there's picnic grounds. I mean, they do volleyball. They've got – there's so much stuff to do. This is literally like a water park. It's a lodge. You can stay the night there. I mean, this – this place is, is busy. It's huge. Mm-hmm. It's not just this little diving section. There's so many things to do even if you don't dive. So they did see the truck the next morning. After determining that no one else had seen Ben, Turan called the Holmes County Sheriff's Office. Ben McDaniel left behind several items in the cab of his truck, including his wallet with $681 in cash, his driver's license, his cell phone, dive logs showing the cave's exploration, and a map he made. He also left behind his dog at the Santa Rosa Beach House. Police believe that McDaniel never resurfaced and might have drowned somewhere in the cave during his dive. Cadaver dogs alerted on the water's surface, further supporting that theory. Supporting the theory that he had drowned somewhere down there? That he had gone, I guess, maybe in the cave and drowned, couldn't get out, I don't know. So really, you think that the, that the cadaver dogs could have hit on that? Don't doesn't the scent get lost in water? 
No, because when a human body is decomposing, it releases gas and bacteria and different things that would be in that water, and the dogs would be able to hit on that. In the surface. I guess that makes sense because I guess I was leaning more towards like tracking dogs. You know, if they say if you run through the water, it loses scent. But they're tracking something different than a cadaver dog. So that makes total sense. Right. Yeah. Like, no. Totally. Totally. Okay. Cadaver just- dogs, I think, are specifically s- looking for the smell of death, decay, the, the bacteria, the gases. The mercaptan or whatever they call it. Something I, like that. I don't know. Whatever that stuff I saw in forensic files that the lab, you know, the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as R.I.P. The, Peter Thomas. I, I listen to him every night on the way to sleep. He puts me to bed. Now, as the word of a missing diver in the Vortex Springs cave got out, other cave divers came from all over for what they assumed would be a recovery operation. Now, the McDaniels were called, and they drove down to Florida along with Ben's girlfriend, Emily Greer, to watch what they could from the shore. It's got to be gut-wrenching and horrifying to sit there, like, you know, knowing full well that your son – is in this hole, and you can't get in there to even help, yeah. you know? So the news media in the Panhandle and Memphis, remember he's from Memphis, followed the search closely, and divers scoured the cave, looking at every small crevice and fissure where Ben might have crawled into, crawled in in a panic attempt to get out as his tanks ran low. Now, a pattern found in other cave diving deaths that have occurred there and other places Many said that later they felt they had risked their own lives to do so, but didn't find Ben. So other divers are saying, look, we risked our life down there. Because remember, this place is deep. It's not. It's mapped out, but it's not mapped out to its end. Yeah. This is a cave. This goes further than people want to go. So they did, however, find some of his equipment. Two tanks known to belong to McDaniel were found near the entrance of the cave. But this discovery struck some searchers as inconsistent with Ben's supposed intent to explore the cave he was technically not permitted to enter. Most cave divers place their extra air tanks, which they need for decompression, at the points along their route so they can follow them out, not at the entrance of the cave. And when tested, the tanks were found to contain just air, not the specialized gas mix Ben would have been likely to use had he been researching cave diving as his parents said he had been for, what, like 15 years? Yeah, he was 30, started So he would have known to decompress, he would need that special gas mixture, not just air. And see, these these tanks were found at the entrance, which leads you to believe that he left them there. So my initial thought was that he had used those tanks up, but these were actually at the entrance. Right. So that would have been – had he needed those tanks, he would have gone further in and they would have used them down there, not at the entrance. So police found no evidence, means, or motive for foul play in Ben McDaniel's disappearance. Divers continued to search for months to no avail. Experienced divers say it would be impossible for Ben to have made it through the narrowest restrictions in the back of the cave. Well, one thing I want to kind of note here is if you if you Google and you actually find a map of Vortex Spring, there's a map of the cave that you can find. And there's areas where it talks about the ceiling heights. So some of the ceiling heights were two feet. So not only do you have narrow paths, you you know, so they say you have to take tanks and hold the side. It, some of these crevices and stuff that you can get to, because there's air pockets and stuff down there too. And this map of the Vortex Springs, they can show that. But these are not only are they narrow, but they're narrow left to right, top to bottom. Yeah. And that's that's the tough part because sometimes, you know, you can wiggle in, but it's hard to wiggle out. You ever built a fish trap, you know, where they, they can swim in, yeah. but they can't swim out. I've never built one, but I know what you're talking about. Naked and afraid. The that's kind of what it is. So if you look at the maps, and then you know you can you get a good feel for if you actually look at the map, you get a good feel for how far away he actually was. You get a good feel for um, where the gate is. So you can really do some research, and it, it you see that it's it's literally cavernous, being a cave, but it's scary as hell because. You're wiggling through these spots that are really small. So a lot of people think, well, it's a cave. It's not a cave in the sense of like you're walking through this massive cave. No, it's like – Television. Yeah, it's – It's tiny. Yeah. Tiny spots. 
So Ed Sorensen, the most experienced cave diver in the area, went further in the cave than any of the other divers and found nothing. He knew that at 210 pounds, Ben, an untrained cave diver, would have never gotten his 6 foot 1 frame through the final crevice that Sorensen wiggled through. I am six foot and 190 pounds with smaller tanks, and I know what I'm doing, and I barely made it through, Sorensen said. The last place I searched was pristine, without a mark that a diver had been there. It would be impossible to go through that restriction without making a mark on the floor or ceiling. He's not in there. And that leads us to something that's similar in sort of all disappearances. Theories. Because these theories start to pop up. Was Ben murdered? Did he disappear on purpose? Did he fake his own death? Now, armchair detectives have gone as far as even pondering the idea that maybe someone found his body floating, dragged it out of the water, and dumped it maybe near an alligator pond or something. Cadaver dogs searched the woods around Vortex Spring without success. Assisted by helicopters, they searched the swamps along the spring's outflow into Blue Creek and Sandy Creek to the... Chaktawati River. 30 separate tests of the water over the next several months showed no sign of an increase in the bacteria that would indicate the presence of a decomposing human body. Taran, who said that he had let Ben into the cave despite knowing he lacked certification to dive in it, passed a lie detector test of his account. So, at least I'm getting the sense that the detectives in this case are doing their due diligence. They are retesting the waters they're they're checking back they're not leaving things sort of twisting in the wind it sounds to me like an investigation is being done at this point to the point where they're even talking to the guy that saw him last open the gate giving a lie detector test right right would you you would agree that the detectives are doing a decent job of investigating this now the thing yes. that i question is they're investigating this for a reason they're obviously trying to get some closure which i like but Frustrated by the limitations the search had thus far encountered and increasingly coming to believe that Ben's body was in an area of the cave that no one had yet reached, the McDaniels come up, right? Never mind the investigation that's going on. The family. The family. And they offer a reward of $10,000. Now, this is money that was raised uh, and contributed at a benefit held on what would have been their son's 31st birthday. At the end of the year, to anyone brave enough... To go to those places and find it. Now, this doesn't bode well in the dive community. Right. Okay. Because the insinuation of cowardice alienated the divers who had already risked their lives searching the cave and raised fear among those that it would only encourage untrained divers to enter the cave and take potentially fatal risks for the reward money. Undeterred, the McDaniels increased the award twice. So they're going to say, okay. Maybe we didn't offer enough money to you guys. But if we offer a little more, offer a little more. What they're trying to do is basically entice the divers to throw money at the problem. Hey, here's a bunch of money. We're going to throw it at the problem. Can you go in there and find our son? Because they're confident that he's in there. And in March of 2012, by which time the reward had been increased to thirty thousand dollars, the fears of the cave divers were realized. So two days before the investigation, Discovery Cable Channel series disappeared. Aired a segment on Ben's case, a diver from Biloxi, Mississippi, Larry Higginbotham, died in the cavern at Vortex Springs. Now, his body was found the next day after he, too, had failed to return from the dive. He just got himself in a pinch and couldn't find his way back out, said one of the divers who recovered the body. The following month, amid increasing criticism, McDaniels rescinded the reward offer. Thank God. Yeah, that was pretty stupid. I mean, I understand a reward. You want to put that out there because you want people to search. But when you're asking people to put their lives at the risk, the way they to search, put it, those brave enough to yes, search, exactly, it, it it doesn't it doesn't even sit well with me. I can only imagine how the divers who had already risked their lives looking for their son felt. Yeah, you know, like, wait, like we weren't brave enough. I mean, we went further than we were supposed to. Right. And most divers, even the most experienced divers, know their limitations. Right. You know, sometimes they find themselves where they have to go a little beyond that. But for the most part, any divers, every diver I've ever met, people that have done a lot of diving, they know, hey, no, you don't do that. You don't do this. You don't do this. There's rules. And guys that are well-trained in this stuff even know that there's certain things you just don't do. 
And really, some of these guys are even pushed to the limit because, honestly, I mean, I'm not much of a snorkeler, but if I knew how to use dive tanks for thirty grand, if I needed the, the money, if I needed a few dollars, I'd have tried it. Not me personally. I'm just saying that as a they yeah. could get anybody. But obviously, they had to be certified to get the gate open. Well, and that's I I that's I up don't in know. the air. So. That's up in the air, exactly. Not only did it endanger the lives of divers who would risk going farther than they should, said Sorensen, who was by then even more firmly convinced that their son had not died in the cave. It put all of our lives at risk because we have to go in to recover the bodies. By that time, the McDaniels had also come to believe that if he had not died in the cave, Ben had been murdered. Huh? The McDaniels began considering the possibility that he had died not in the diving accident, but as a result of foul play, and that the disappearance might have been staged to cover up, cover that up, or at the very least, he had been found dead by the dive shop staff, who feared the consequences of that discovery. They hired a Florida private investigator, Lynn Marie Cardi, who found that some people associated with Vortex Springs had criminal records. Lowell Kelly, at the time, the owner of Vortex Spring, was facing criminal charges. He had allegedly taken a temporary employee who he said owed him thousands of dollars out into an isolated wooded area and attempted to beat him with a baseball bat to make him pay up. The man escaped, and prosecutors later charged Kelly with assault and kidnapping in the incident. In 2011, Kelly pled no contest to the charges, and in return, he was fined and sentenced to seven years probation. He did not live long enough to complete even one of those years. During a chilly cook-off he was hosting at Vortex Spring in December, Kelly reportedly fell down the stairs and hurt his head. A person present took him to his home in Ponce de Leon, where he helped Kelly shower and afterwards put a blanket over him and left him to rest in the bathtub. In the morning, a different person came to the house and found his condition had worsened overnight. Emergency medical services responded to the call and took him to the hospital in Pensacola. Kelly remained comatose, and after his condition did not improve, he was transferred to hospice care, where he died the following month. So they're having this chili cook-off. This guy falls down, goes boom, hits his head, and then... Someone takes him to, all right, well, I'm going to take him back to his place. They get him in the bath, get him all cleaned up, and they cover him up and leave him lay there in the bathtub? Yeah. And then the next day someone comes by and goes, okay, you're not doing so good. Let's get you to the hospital. And the hospital's like, there's nothing we can do. And they send him to hospice. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that's the sequence of events there because it was that whole, eh. The Holmes County Sheriff's Office which had also been the lead agency investigating the McDaniel disappearance, implied that it had not gotten a full story of what had occurred the night of Kelly's injury and that it had some questions it wanted answers. So did Ken. However, police would not name the individuals who had taken Kelly home and found him there in the morning. The sheriff's office also refused to release the autopsy report to the Northwest Florida Daily News despite its status as a public record under Florida's Sunshine Laws. It claimed that release of the report would compromise an ongoing investigation. This leads to a theory that Kelly was murdered because he knew something about Ben McDaniel's murder, or possibly the disposal of his body, if that's what had happened. So, continuing in that direction... Some other events reported to have occurred on that day Ben disappeared supported the foul play theory. Now, Lowell Kelly said shortly afterwards on that evening, a man described as wild-eyed and apparently drunk showed up at the shop and asked if it was too late to dive. The possibility has been raised that this man, if if he existed, may have been involved. Now, earlier that day, a diver had a confrontation with several teenagers on the property about their drinking. They eventually left, but may have come back in an attempt to exact that revenge. So these are kind of the working theories that the police and investigators have. Among the divers who heard about the case was Jill Heenerth, a Canadian who had set the world record for deepest dive by a woman. 
Afterwards, she and her husband, Robert McClellan, both certified cave divers and documentary filmmakers, went to Vortex Spring to make a short video. They hoped to show it to the McDaniel family in the hopes of giving them a better understanding of the risks associated with cave diving and closure, as Heinerth put it. At the time, she believed that Ben, whatever his fate, was not in the cave. But then during the research process, she was able to read Ben's dive logs and the map he had made. She realized that he had, in fact, gotten very far into the cave. Knowing that divers in trouble will often burrow deeper into narrow crevices, such as those within the cave, in a mistaken effort to get back to the surface, she revised her opinion. I simply see no reasonable evidence that he is not in the cave, the commercial appeal quoted her as writing in an email. She and McClellan turned their private video short into a feature-length documentary, Ben's Vortex, released in 2012. It considers all of the theories regarding its subject's disappearance, an accident as originally believed, a murder or cover-up of an accident, as the McDaniels have sometimes alleged, and the possibility of a staged disappearance to allow Ben to escape his problems, which McClellan believes. McClellan leads towards the possibility that Ben had a psychotic breakdown and might have compulsively decided to reinvent himself. It was an idea floated on scubaboard.com and bandied about by several scuba divers who pictured a 30-year-old sitting on the beach in Mexico. McClellan, who is a nurse, worked with addicted and traumatized patients who simply left their lives. I could see that, you know, where you want to start all over, you know. So you you have to do it in such a way, you, you know, he's in the cave, he gets the guy to open the gate, that guy leaves, and he disappears. It's like the perfect setup. Right. However... Ben's parents do not believe Ben had any intention of abandoning his life. He had left his dog in Santa Rosa Beach. He left his dog. I yeah. Mean, me, that, I, right there, that's just like, you don't leave your dog. Exactly. If it was me, I'd be like, all right, Oliver, look, here's a deal. I'm gonna have, This is going to happen. I'm going to come get you. We're out of here. So, <laughs> and, and so I'd have to get Oliver. I can't leave the dog. So I, I, I'll leave it at that. Well, Shelby, also his father, also noted that Ben had – seen the impact of Paul's death, his younger brother, and he had witnessed what this had done to the parents. After what we went through with Paul, we know our son well enough to know that he wouldn't put us through that again. This is what his mother told the commercial appeal. So let's just look at the main theories here. There's several theories, but let's, let's just cover these the, the main ones. Number one, Ben McDaniel took a dive that night, got himself into a place in the cave he couldn't get out of, Maybe he panicked and drowned. So although some of the most experienced divers in the world have searched this cave, going even further than anyone ever has, and his body has not been found, and there's no indication or evidence that Ben's body is in the water. Well, with that being said, he would have to have been lodged somewhere. But again, he would have to have gone farther than most people would ever gone. Now, I have actually looked at the map that Ben physically drew of the, ca- of the cave. Is that cave. something we can put on our social media yeah, for our listeners it, to yeah, see? Yeah, it's available. Okay. Basically, Eduardo Turan is the one – I call him Turan. You said Turan. You say tomato. I say tomato. But Eduardo Turan had basically drawn this map up. This map is – the cave diagram is by him. But there's notes and everything by – there's air box, the first rest – uh, the rock, sandy bottom. There's different notes on the map that they found that Ben had done. And one of the things that I find interesting, and there's a lot of lot of writing on there, like 20, you know, 20, 121, 31, 116, 32, 111. I don't know what that means. A lot of divers would know what that means if they're looking at the map. But on the map specifically, it says 150 minutes, max O2 time. And there's some other scribbles there. So I'm assuming, and it says 180 minutes, 24 something. That's what it looks like to me on the map. But let's just talk about 150 minutes. You're talking, uh, what's that? That's two and a half hours? So with that being said, that's like basically an hour and 15 minutes there, hour and 15 minutes back. So is it possible that he went beyond where he should have? 
you would think that an experienced diver would have gone to a certain distance knowing, okay, look, I've got an hour and 15 minutes because his map shows he's got his time set up. Okay, and an experienced diver knows, hey, look, I've got to have enough to get there and back. It's possible that he would have traveled a little bit further beyond that if he had tanks set in other places. But like Lauren had mentioned earlier, the tank that was at the entrance didn't really ha- at the entrance of the gate didn't have the right mixture in it. And we know that he filled this tank because he went to the dive shop. Exactly. So we're going to post that map on there so you can get an idea. But what I wanted to kind of let people know is that you know an experienced diver would go an hour and fifteen minutes out, hour and fifteen minutes back. And that's full tanks, I'm assuming. But I don't want to get too far in there because I honestly don't know anything about this map and how it reads because I'm not a diver any way, shape, or form. But I just saw the 150 minutes and it got me thinking that an experienced guy wouldn't know how far he could go with that kind of time. But he also knows that, okay, he's got to get back. So it's I'm going to lean towards if he's down in that cave, something happened. He went further than he should have and he got caught up. Or maybe he tried to push it a little bit further and something happened. But you would think he would have at some point turned and came back unless he got stuck somewhere. Yeah. So theory number two, like I said, Ben did drown in the cave. But someone, possibly Lowell Kelly, who we spoke about earlier, the guy that was in the bathtub, he was the owner, he covered it up. And they possibly found him. So they found Ben. They removed him from the water and then to dispose of his body somewhere else. And this was done possibly to avoid any civil liability. Well, yeah, that would make sense because the guy unlocked the gate for him, knowing full well he was not certified to dive in that cave. And then come to find out he drowned, the the spring would be held responsible for that because somebody in charge unlocked that gate. For him. You know that. You know, I didn't think about that aspect. What you just said right there is because I was trying to think of why would they, I can understand they would want to basically dispose of his body saying, hey, oh my God, we got to hide this guy. What happened? This guy drowned down there. But you're right. If he opened the gate, that basically ensures the liability is on. Right. Exactly. So the third theory is Ben was murdered, but by who? There's no indication that he had any enemies or any recent altercations with anyone. And who would have motive to murder him? Exactly. You know, I, mean, I don't I don't feel like that I don't I don't buy into that theory like at all. I I don't buy into the he was murdered theory at all. I think I like theory 1 and 2 better. But there is another cuz in these situations we always have to look at the fact that Theory number four that we got to look at is Ben possibly took his own life. Now, it's been said that at the time of his death, Ben was being prescribed an antidepressant, a benzodiazepine, as well as Adderall. Now, I'm no doctor, but I find this to be an odd combination, and Lauren will kind of describe this to you. So Adderall is a stimulant. It's If you are not ADD or ADHD and you take Adderall, it works as a stimulant. It's like speed in a way. A lot of college kids do it so they can stay up and study or they can go, go, go. But then we have benzodiazepines, who, which are downers, usually prescribed for somebody with anxiety or panic disorders. They're definitely downers. And the antidepressant could have been described for depression and or anxiety, because a lot of antidepressant medications are used for not just depression, but anxiety as well. And we'll obviously never know why Ben was prescribed these specific medications. But it's just interesting to note that this combination of drugs that he was taking is definitely strange. Yeah, and this theory doesn't quite fit. His family all believe that he was doing great. And looking toward the future, I mean, despite all of his recent setbacks between the IRS, his business closing, they thought everything is just fine and dandy. And again, if it's suicide, where's his body? Most suicides are usually done in such a way to where they're found. Right. That's not always the case, but predominantly the, we, in the cases we research and stuff, if there's a suicide involved, 
they usually do it in such a way to where they're going to be found. They're not trying to hide. Right. And the last theory we have is that he faked his own death and disappeared. And this one seems a little far-fetched. Especially since he left his dog. Contrary to what you see in movies, disappearing yourself is really, really hard to do and is extremely expensive. Even going, even the time frame. I mean, nowadays, I mean, every year it gets worse. The more social media, the more prevalent we find with technology. It's really, really hard to hide. Even back, go back 10 years, it was hard to do. And very, like Lauren said, very expensive. So this brings us to, I guess, the ultimate question. What happened to Ben McDaniel? What happened to Ben McDaniel? We don't so, know. I mean, this th- to me, this case does sound a little D.B. Cooperish. <laughs> I guess it does a little. Because but he, he didn't hijack a plane or steal a bunch of money, so. No, well, that we know of. But if there's so many theories. And here's the thing with, that's got to be tough as being an investigative team. If you're an investigator on this. Now, these are trained detectives. And for the most part, we find that most people that make it detective status that, that do these cases – they're pretty good at their job. So it's like, okay, we, what you have to do is do like me and Lauren did this, or Lauren and I, I should say, rather. Shut up, Shannon. Um, basically put this together and say, okay, these are the theories that we've got. Let's take a look at these theories. Okay, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, if he was murdered, okay, he wasn't murdered. Did he disappear? But if his body's not found down there, if they don't have a body, it's tough to go a direction. I know. You know, I mean, it's different when you're an investigator and you show up at a crime scene and you have a body, then you've got something to work with. So, But I'm very impressed, like I said earlier, with the investigators and the fact that they were literally testing the waters months later. They were doing all these things that they could do to keep this case relevant. I'm very disappointed. I'm not going to say disappointed. That's a bad term to use in the family for you know putting that all, those offers out there because Ben's death resulted in another death, and I, I hate to hear that. Yeah. I'm not blaming the family by no means. I mean, the guy obviously knew his limitations. He knew the dangers. But it's just, it, it's kind of a sad case because here you got this guy who's missing. He's very young. Obviously, he had some bad stuff going on. But when you're young, that happens. You always have a chance to, to, to grow and get better, you know? And it's just a really sad case and very mysterious because you really don't know. There's so many theories with this case. Yeah. There is. And I don't, I don't, I. Don't is there a feel- theory you favor more? If I had to pick a theory, I would say that he probably drowned and the people at the Vortex Spring covered it up. That's that's what makes the most sense to me. And they would have the motive to do it if he drowned to avoid, like I said, civil liability. If I had to pick a theory, that's that's the one I would go with. So I, I'm, I'm very curious, and obviously we don't know because he's never been released, who it was that basically helped Mr. Kelly, or Kelly Lowell rather, get... Lowell Kelly was his name. Yeah, Mr. Kelly. I guess I said it right the first time then. You did. So whoever helped him, or should I say rather put him in the bathtub, quotes, I'm doing air quotes, can't see, whoever helped him... In the bathtub, maybe I really wish that if that was Tehran or Cronin, it's a very good possibility that your theory is good, sticks, which may be the case, which is why investigators did not release the names because it'd be pretty evident that, okay, well, this kind of adds up too much. You know what I mean? All the stuff kind of comes together too much. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to confuse you with the listeners because, you know, so you understand what I'm saying? I do understand what okay, you're saying. Okay, she's shaking her head at me, but... I'm not shaking, I'm nodding. <laughs> what? What? Is that a nod? Okay. So Do I anyway, need to be super pronounced for you? Preferably. It's always better that way. Um, but anyway, so this case is very mysterious. It's obviously an unsolved case. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't even think that there's any more investigation going on. You can watch the documentary. I think what channel? Did, what channel? Or there's a it? couple. Uh, there's a. I don't know where to find the Ben's Vortex documentary, um, but I do know that Investigation Discovery has an episode on its show disappeared about Ben McDaniel. 
Yeah, and this is a case that it, it's it's like anything else. It can be solved. Maybe. But you're, it's going to take a lot of information. That is not going to... Maybe gonna, the people that, who have that information are no longer alive. Exactly. I don't know. I'm, we're just mumbling now. Probably should have stopped five minutes up. ago. Let's wrap it up because five minutes ago we should have stopped. All right. Again, if you'd like to support this show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-A-M-A-H-A-W-K And yeah. check out our website for links to our social media, Patreon, and much, much more. Please make sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Paradise After Dark. Duck, 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 duck.